Hello, I'm Sophie Ikenya. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. Lesotho's Prime Minister Thomas Tabane in court. His lawyers argue he can't be charged with the murder of his estranged wife as his position makes him immune from prosecution. I find that there is indeed a substantial question of law raised. The application for referral of the matter to the High Court is granted. South Sudan's president and rival leaders strike a deal to form a unity government, but key issues remain unresolved. As the WHO tells us to prepare for a potential coronavirus pandemic, the economic damage is beginning to bite. We look at the impact in Africa. Also in the program, where do broken hearts go? We get some words of advice from author Chidera Egrule about how women can rebalance relationships with men. Why is a man's validation more important than your validation of him? Because we're not taught enough that women are the ones that do the choosing. And in sport, the former General Secretary of the African football body, CAF, Amir Fakhmi, has died. We'll look at the role he played in the organization. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The Prime Minister of Lesotho, Thomas Tabane, has appeared in court to hear charges of murdering his estranged wife. He failed to appear on Friday, claiming he had travelled to South Africa for medical treatment. Lipolelo Tabane was shot dead in 2017, two days before her husband was due to begin a second term as Prime Minister. Now, his current wife has also been implicated in the murder. Let's now speak to our Southern African reporter, Pumza Fihlani. Mr. Tabane appeared in court today. Tell us, bring us up to speed with what happened there. He appeared, Sophie, thronged by his bodyguards and his wife, Maisaya Tabane, who you mentioned there, has already been charged for the murder of Dipulelo Tabane. He was expected to be charged today, but the case seems to have hit a legal difficulty, as Magistrate Petise Mutanyani explains. This is indeed a novel case in our country and whose determination we, we shall eagerly anticipate. Having had submissions from both sides and on authority of the decision of the Court of Appeal in the case of Motobi and Anara versus the Crown to which this court was referred, I find that there is indeed a substantial question of law raised. The application for referral of the matter to the High Court is granted. So the high, uh, the high Court in Maseru effectively needs to hear the case and decide on whether uh, Tom Tabane as a sitting Prime Minister can actually be criminally charged. You'll know that Lesotho is a, is a constitutional monarch so it is very clear that the King is protected from legal prosecution but it is rather silent on the fate of the Prime Minister. So a panel of judges will have to hear the case and make a decision. But this of course will have implications for the people of Lesotho and the criminal system there. What was his reaction in court today Pumza? He said very quietly throughout the entire proceedings. It was a short appearance. His wife sat alongside him and one of his children. He said he did barely, barely uh, maintained contact with any of the media there. The courtroom was really packed with just also ordinary people from Lesotho wanting to get a chance to see the Prime Minister on the dock and very curious about what was happening with the case. We do know that this is something that has been a huge embarrassment for the Prime Minister and it is a case, of course, that the people of Lesotho and indeed the region Region are watching very closely. So what do we expect to happen next? Take us through step by step if you can. So this effectively now begins to uh, becomes a test of the legal system. So a judge, uh, a chief justice rather, needs to be appointed who will be sitting and hearing the case along with at least three other judges and they need to decide where, which direction this case goes. This is a novel case as we heard the magistrate explaining there. So there is no case law to go by. So the judges really need to apply the law as they understand it and try to interpret it. But of course this case is very serious. This is a serious murder accusation. So the courts will be considering the implications of choosing not to prosecute Mr. Tabane and, and weigh those against what would happen if the case proceeds. All right, Pumza Fiklani for us there with that update. Thank you. 
Well, let's take a quick look at other stories making headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. Now, in the last hour, a jury in New York has found the movie producer Harvey Weinstein guilty of sexual assault and third-degree rape, but has cleared him of other charges, including one of predatory sexual assault, which could have meant him facing life in prison. The jury had been deliberating for several days, but took only around two hours to finalize its verdict today. Since 2017, more than 80 women men have accused Weinstein of sexual misconduct. The Tanzanian investigative journalist Eric Kabendera has been freed after spending six months behind bars. He was convicted of tax evasion and money laundering but entered a plea deal. Other charges relating to organized crime were, drop, were dropped. He has uh, agreed to pay $75,000 within six months on his tax evasion. President Fo Nyasingbe of Togo has uh, told his rivals to accept the preliminary results indicating that he won Saturday's election by a landslide. Addressing his supporters, the president, who's been in power since 2005, said this was the game of democracy. Several opposition candidates have said the vote was marred by fraud. Peace is here. That's the message from South Sudan's president after forming a unity government with rival leaders on Saturday and swearing in rebel leader Riek Machar as first vice president. It's the country's latest attempt at peace after six years of civil war and almost 400,000 deaths. But there are still outstanding issues including power sharing and integrating rebel fighters. Our reporter Catherine Biaruhanga is in Juba with this update. It's taken months and two missed deadlines to get to this point. But over the past few days, South Sudanese have seen the two most important leaders in this country shake hands, hug and agree to work together to end their people's suffering. Four vice presidents have also been appointed this past weekend. And we actually heard of parties at the homes of some of the newly appointed leaders. But come Monday, today, it's a different atmosphere. It's all about political negotiations, setting up a council of ministers, what's going to be the new cabinet going forward. Why this is important is that these are the people who are going to run this country for the next three years up until elections are held. And it will also show us what the makeup of power is in a new, in a new South Sudan. Who is going to control key ministries like finance, petroleum, defence? So these are some of the questions going forward. But what does this all mean for the millions of South Sudanese who have had to flee their homes? We went to visit one of the camps for displaced people here in Juba. And what people had to tell us there is that they're not quite sure it's time to go home yet. They say they want to see more proof that they will be secure and protected should they go back to their towns and villages. Catherine Biaruhanga reporting there. Now as more cases and clusters emerge around the world, thousands of kilometers away from the origin in China, fears are growing that the coronavirus outbreak could reach pandemic scale. And the virus has now spread to more than 30 countries outside China. In Iran, the official number of confirmed deaths has now risen to 12. And Italy has reported the worst outbreak of coronavirus in Europe, where six people have died and more than 200 are infected. So far, only the only confirmed case in Africa is in Egypt. But even without a single confirmed case, sub-Saharan Africa may be the region hardest hit outside of Asia. Now, the outbreak has shut down entire segments of the Chinese economy, reducing demand for African oil and metals that are the lifeline of many nations. And as Emmanuel Igunza reports from Nairobi, supply chains with the continent's largest trading partner are already being disrupted. This is Nairobi's Garissa Lodge, or Little Mogadishu, as it's popularly known. It's a vibrant wholesale and retail market that sells everything. Over the years, it has carved a niche for itself as being a hub for cheap mass goods imported from China. But there are growing fears. The epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak might be thousands of kilometers away, yet its effects are starting to be felt by local traders. I travel up to three times a year to China to get stock. Some traders go up to four times and it all depends on the money you have 
For now, no one has been able to travel. We were planning to go early this month, but we can't travel because of the advisory. So we are just waiting to see how the situation unfolds. The situation is the same in neighboring Ethiopia, which hosts a large Chinese population engaged in building and manufacturing sectors. Chinese goods are a big part of the market, but traders are worried about the coming weeks. We still have stock in our stores and haven't faced a big problem yet. But since the Chinese in many parts there are not working at a full capacity, there's a delay in the letter of requests and it is scary. Other companies that import tools from China are also affected. Most of the markets are still closed there, so they are not taking orders. If this is not resolved quickly, I fear there will be shortages of goods in Ethiopia. So just how important are the Sino-Africa trade relations? All African countries except Eswatini do business with China. China exports machinery, electronics and textiles to the continent. It is also heavily involved in manufacturing and construction industries. Though trade balance is skewed in favor of China, it imports vast quantities of crude oil, steel and iron ore and cotton. China had earlier projected that the trade between it and Africa will surpass $300 billion this year, but this could be hampered by the outbreak and falling commodity prices. African airlines are also feeling the pinch. Eight continental carriers have direct flights to China and between them share more than 200 flights a month. So far, six have suspended their flights, costing operators millions of dollars in losses. However, Africa's largest airline, Ethiopian Airlines, has defied critics and has continued operating flights to five different cities daily. The continent remains on high alert over a possible outbreak. So far, only one case has been reported in Egypt. Experts agree that it's too early yet to assess the full impact of the coronavirus. But as it continues to spread, African economies so reliant and intertwined with China brace for the worst. Imanuel Gunza, BBC News, Nairobi. Now one of those countries bracing for the worst, as Emmanuel put it, is Nigeria. Businesses, schools and hospitals are all taking steps to stop the virus in its tracks. But as the BBC's Yemisi Adegoke found out in Lagos, concerns over the impact are spreading faster than the virus itself. There hasn't been a positive case of coronavirus in sub-Saharan Africa yet. But here in Lagos, people are already starting to take precautions. Thank you. Preventive measures like temperature checks and hand sanitizers are being rolled out in businesses and schools across the city as it braces itself for a potential outbreak. If a suspected case of coronavirus is found, it would end up here, at Lagos University Teaching Hospital, one of the three centres in the country that can test for the virus. How are you? You're welcome. That's good. We are fully prepared uh, for the detection. So we have all the facilities here for detecting VHFs, viral hemorrhagic fevers, uh, Ebola, Lassa, yellow fever. And uh, for the coronavirus, so we are equally prepared. So we have all that it takes to make the detection under one hour, one and a half hours. There is uh, an isolation ward I think it uh, accommodates about uh, four or six patients. The labs and isolation centres might be ready to go, but there are still concerns within the community about the impact a potential outbreak could have. Hi ladies, hi kids. Thank you so much for having us at your little hangout. Um, what are some of the preventative measures that you're taking or that schools are taking in order to just stay on top of this? My son came home and told me that <laughs> I need to get him hand sanitizer. The one that has what again? 60 percent alcohol. <laughs> is this the hand sanitizer? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you want to show me how you use it? Yeah. Oh. I'm not so happy about the fact that our government is very reactive. Like we wait for things to happen before we react. So how about we plan for things? Don't think I am confident enough in the ability to stem this should it come into Nigeria. The World Health Organization has identified 13 priority countries, including Nigeria. If the virus hits, preventative measures will go a long way to curbing its spread.
Yemisi Adegoke, BBC News, Lagos. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News, still to come in sport. After his brilliant performance over the weekend, Arsenal head coach Mikel Ateta hopes that Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang stays at the club. I'm Sophie Ikenya and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top stories on this program, Lesotho's Prime Minister Thomas Tabane in court. His lawyers argue he cannot be charged over the murder of his estranged wife as his position makes him immune from prosecution. South Sudan's president and rival leaders strike a deal to form a unity government but key issues remain unresolved. Now, how do you deal with heartbreak or get over a relationship that turns sour? Uh, these are issues we all face at some point, and for young women, it can be particularly a hard road to navigate. But a new book by Nigerian author Chidera Egrue offers some help. How to get over a boy has one key message, love yourself. The BBC's Lisa Marie Mishtak has been speaking to her. Do you ever find yourself in scenarios with men where you feel weirdly roped into a particular situation you didn't really ask for? Sometimes it could be that he's too hands-on with you and you've only just met. Other times it might feel like he's giving you unsolicited advice or mansplaining. Or it could simply be that he expects you to listen to all his problems all the time just because you like him. These situations feel absolutely terrible to be in, especially when, deep down, you know better. How to get over a boy. What inspired this book? When you're someone who doesn't have many boundaries or when, as a young woman, you're taught to believe that male validation is the most important thing you can achieve in this life, then that's how you end up in very ambiguous and unnecessary dynamics with people. So I really wanted to inject my own personal stories into this to show people how I got out of it, my thought process, how I dealt with it, because those examples matter. But also a lot of the time when you see someone articulate an experience in a way you haven't quite thought of it, it then makes you investigate and examine your own. And then you start to create your own tools to get through it just by hearing someone else say, I was here and I went through the same thing and here's how I got out of it. This book is particularly aimed at women and their situation. What do you hope that they will achieve from reading this book? I hope women will finally understand that you lose nothing by letting go of men who can't do anything for you. Because society has intentionally painted men in a way where they appear to be more important than us. They appear to be the heroes of our timeline. I want to challenge that and ask why is that significant? Why is a man's validation more important than your validation of him? Because we're not taught enough that women are the ones that do the choosing. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sport. Mimi? Thank you, Sophie. We begin with a story that broke over the weekend. That is the death of the former Confederation of African Football General Secretary, Amr Fami, at the age of 37. After a two-year battle with cancer, he served his, in his role from November 2017 to April 2019, when he was subsequently removed from his position without explanation. BBC's Mohamed Kudba has been giving us the reaction back in his country, Egypt. The funeral of the ex-CAF Secretary General Amr Fami took place on Sunday night in Cairo. It was attended by a group of his friends from the Egyptian football sphere as CAF released a statement sending condolences to the Fami family. Fami wasn't only a football official, he was one of the members who founded the Ultras Ahlawi, the biggest supporting group for Al Ahli Football Club. He was even mourned yesterday by a group of Ultras supporting the fierce rivals Zamalek. Fami took the heritage of his grandfather and father, who both served as CAF Secretary General. BBC Sport Africa's Piers Edwards, who closely follows affairs at CAF, had spoken to Amr Fami over the years and joins me from the newsroom studio. Piers, how significant a figure was Amra at CAF? Well, as Mohammed mentioned there, the Fami family has been hugely important to CAF over the years. Both his grand, well, his grandfather was a founder member of CAF, and uh, both his grandfather and father were general secretaries of CAF, running the organization for nearly 50 years. Amra Fami himself lasted considerably less 
uh, less than 18 months, in fact, before he was dismissed without official explanation, as we've heard. But what we do know is that shortly before he was removed from his post, he had officially complained to FIFA about corruption at the top of CAF, uh, which prompted football's world governing body to open an investigation. CAF has denied any wrongdoing, but that complaint could be FAMI's lasting legacy should FIFA find any reason to take action. Now, just two months ago, FAMI himself announced a bid to become the uh, CAF president ahead of the 2021 elections, saying he would campaign on being pro-football and anti-corruption. However, that vision, that dream is, of course, now over. Thank you so much, Pierce, for that analysis. All right, let's move on. Chelsea have agreed personal terms with Ajax winger Hakim Ziyech over a five-year deal, which will see the Morocco international move to Stamford Bridge for over $40 million in the summer. Elsewhere, there's only one English Premier League match today. Liverpool can go 22 points clear at the top of the table if they beat West Ham. South Africa have beaten England for the first time at the Women's World Cup T20 match by six wickets. They now play Thailand on Friday. Arsenal boss Mikel Arteta says he's hoping to keep Gabon star Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang at the club. Aubameyang scored twice against Everton on Sunday to take his tally to 19 goals this season and 60-95 games for Arsenal. His current contract runs out next year and he's been linked with a move away. Arteta says he's hoping the club can convince him that Arsenal is the right place to be that they are completely right to want him because he's a superb player. He completely deserves to be liked by other teams, but hopefully we can convince him that this is the right place for him and he has a future here. Good performances like that and victories like that are going to help him to, to want to stay, to want to sign the contract? Hopefully, and not just the wins, but as well what we are trying to do, that he really enjoys on that pitch every time he goes, that he feels very much part of what we are trying to, to build here. And I think he's with that mindset at the moment. So Obama Yang staying put for now at Arsenal. That's all the sports. Sophie. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. Now, the BBC is yet again seeking a rising star of African journalism for the BBC World News Komla Dumo Award, now in its sixth year. Journalists from across the continent are invited to apply for the award, which aims to uncover and promote fresh talent from Africa. In memory of Komla Dumo, we wanted this award to be a sign of the BBC's investment in the future of Africa's journalism. If you are ambitious and serious about your profession as a journalist, then this is the opportunity you've been looking for. Winning the BBC World News Komla Dumo Award did an amazing thing for my career. Winning this award was an open door into the BBC newsroom. And as a journalist, I have grown. The winner gets to spend three months with the BBC. They also get time and support to work on an original piece of journalism. My scripting has improved. My interviewing skills have become better. Any journalist worth their salt should be applying for this award. It's an amazing opportunity to go from this level to that level in a very short time with the best in terms of training. Whatever it is that you have may be what the BBC is looking for. You need to take this opportunity seriously and apply. For more details on how to apply, please visit bbc.com forward slash Komla Dumont. Well, good luck to all of you. Before we go, a quick look at our top stories on Focus on Africa. Lawyers for Lesotho's Prime Minister have told a court that he cannot be charged over the murder of his estranged wife because his position makes him immune from prosecution. And in the last hour, a jury in New York has found the movie producer Harvey Weinstein guilty of sexual assault and third degree rape, but it cleared him of other charges, including one of predatory sexual assault. Well, don't forget, you can get in touch with me and some of the team on social media. I'm Atsi Kenya. But for now, thanks for your company. Bye.